Thank you. I'm not, I'm not sure practical and I should go together, but we'll see what we can do. And uh, you probably have more good ideas than I do, but we'll see what we can do. I'm reasonably confident that, that I don't need to do much of the background, but the two minute skinny version, right? Are we changing the atmosphere? Sure. Is it RCO2? Sure. We know we can see the drop in oxygen that's feeding the rise in CO2. It's burning. We actually are burning something. Well, you'll still be able to breathe, but it, it, this is us. We're changing the... Is the world warming? Yeah. Uh, you see warming with every way we know how to measure it. Weather has not gone away. And so if you look at the history of warming, it sort of wiggles up. There are still cold months. There are still cold years. There are still people that like to point at one cold year and say, oh, look, global warming stopped. Yeah, um, you know, climate doesn't make weather go away. It still is there. But if you average over the weather, you see it's getting warmer. Are these related? Yeah, with very high scientific confidence. We're changing things. It's mostly us. And you now see this if you're paying attention. You see it in changes in where the ice is. You see it in who's living where. You see things moving up the mountain ranges as it gets warmer. You see them moving towards the poles. You see them moving earlier in the spring. The changes so far are small. If we burn all the oil, it'll probably still be small. If we burn all the coal and the tar sands, it's going to get huge. And it will be pretty much everyone will know it. Now, the changes are happening. Right now, the changes are bad if you're poor, if you live in a hot place, if you are trying to live in a traditional way, or if you're a wild critter. The changes don't, you haven't been ruined yet. None of you have actually been trashed in your lives by global warming. For those of us who live in cold places and have lots of money, it's not a big deal. And so the first thing that makes all of this difficult, and it's why probably you need Nancy Tuana out here at some point to chat with you, um, <laughs> is that a lot of this is an ethical issue. The people that are benefiting from burning fossil fuels are us. And the people that are being hurt by it either are the poor people living in hot places now or they're the people that aren't born yet. And it gets bad for the people living in hot places pretty soon and it gets bad for the people that aren't born yet. And so there's a big ethical piece that keeps sticking its nose into this um, and that we have to keep track of. Now, this business, we use energy. And you know, you know the numbers. We sort of use 100 times more energy than we eat. So if you add up, if you burned your lunch and your dinner and your breakfast in your car, that would be about 1% of the energy you need for a day to keep you going. And so we sort of burn 100 times. And it's basically all fossil fuel. It's a very good approximation. And this is part of us. There's this wonderful idea, I'm still not sure if it's true or not, but there's this wonderful idea that we're actually human in part because we figured out how to get more energy sources. It's, it's very clear, you know, if you, you read the stuff on don't freeze to death in the winter, they always say put on a hat. Why? Because there's so much heat coming out of your head. Why? Because you've got such a big brain in there. And that big brain takes an immense amount of energy. And the question is, how can somebody who's living on the edge of survival afford to have that big brain? And one way to afford to have that big brain is to cook your food. You get the fire to do some of the digestion for you. And in fact, there's experiments now. People have actually done this. If you get a bunch of snakes and you put them in a calorimeter and you keep track of what they're doing, the ones that you feed the, the cooked ground beef grow better. And they're more efficient because they're spending less energy on digesting. Humans who, who cook their food probably enable a large brain, which is fascinating. And so what it says is we were swiping energy from somebody else from day one, OK? But that's just a little bit of energy. That's burning a little wood to get something. And now, like I say, we're swiping 100 times more. And we're on a path that's not sustainable. You know, eventually we run out of oil, eventually we run out of coal, eventually we run out of other things. And so the question is, how do we move from where we are to get something sustainable? Now, in terms of our, how we get there, some of it is us. 
If we're using 100 times, you know, as a country, we use more energy per capita than any of the other major countries. We're sort of double, double Europe and, what, 10 times a whole bunch of other places and more than that elsewhere. So a whole lot of it is us. We'll come back later. It's not all us. If we try conserving, we're going to be efficient. Um, some people say at yeah, 10% you can save. Some people say 50%, maybe a third, something like that. But sort of without grotesquely changing what we do and, and where we are and how we live, there's a huge saving which is possible. Some of it is things like you actually putting up with me showing up in this outfit and probably just slightly aromatic. So, um, you know, <laughs> and, and that really is part of it. Because if you look at me and say, ooh, what's wrong with him? Um, then I have to drive out, you know, the, the, my email said, you know, we'll find you a parking place. So, um, in fact, I did, I bicycled out here. And that is a piece of it. If we can do that, we can save a lot. And some of this is sort of long-term decisions. I had the good fortune when we were buying a house 20 years ago, 19 years ago, when we were buying the house, Cindy had this list of things, you know, we need a laundry room, we need a, you know, we gotta have space for the kids, we gotta have a yard for the kids, blah, 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 blah. I had two things on my list. One was that it had to have siding so I didn't have to paint it. <laughs> and, <laughs> and the other one was I had to be able to commute on my bicycle or on my feet to get to work. And we made that decision 20 years. I've never paid Penn State for parking. Okay. <laughs> yes. All right. So, 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 and and it's it, this sort of thing is a decision that once it's made, if you decided to buy your giant house out at the end of Gatesburg Road, it's probably going to be hard to walk in on a snowy day, and it's going to be hard to get the the mass transit to work very well in some of these places too. So some of them are decisions we make, some of them is just the morning. You get up in the morning and say, wow, it'd be nice to drive the car, it's raining. And then you say, oh, I didn't pay for the parking sticker. So you're stuck. So, um, so we can probably, by doing windows, by doing sweaters, by doing sweaters in the winter and t-shirts in the summer, by doing the bicycle when we can, we probably can sort of cut a third or something in that neighborhood. And that's a big deal. It really is. Now that's not just us. And I was with the camera here, I was nervous about doing this and I'm going to do it anyway, but I'm going to preface this first, right? Penn State is doing amazing things. There is a lot of good green going on here. So if I pick on Penn State for a minute, recognize that I'm doing it with full recognition of how much good is going on here. But I rode out here and I got out on Burroughs and Burroughs for a little while had a bike lane painted. You won't find it now, it faded, it's gone. Um, I, could have, I could have come up the, the next one over on Frasier, and right today I could have gone through, but yesterday there was a construction vehicle parked over the bike lane, and usually, often there's a construction vehicle parked right in the middle of the bike lane, and one year they dumped the entire mulch pile there and left it there for three weeks, okay? I could have come across Curtin and gotten to the, the intersection where my bicycle won't tri trigger the light so I can go through and then tried to get through the new intersection where they got rid of the bike lane. As it is, I came down Park, which is not really Penn State's, which is nice and narrow and it's got the, all around here, the sewer grate is in the middle of the lane, so if you don't want to go over the giant bump on your bicycle, you got to get out in a narrow lane. I came out, you go, you know, you zip down Fox Hollow and across Orchard and down Wiley and over Pasture View, and then you try to cut down through that, that underpass. Now, when they were constructing, there were about two years that if you'd have gone in that underpass, you'd have disappeared because it was this gigantic mud hole. And when they finally fixed it, now the people truck through there in their pickup trucks doing about 40, and there's supposed to be a mirror right at the curve so that when you're coming down the hill, you can see whether the truck's coming and the mirror is supposed to be right there, but it's broken off, it's not there. And then you go up the path where it's falling apart under the trucks and it's just, just gravel and where they trenched across it and they just put gravel in rather than repaving it. And you come to the place that they did fix it for about for a year when they were building 328 innovation out here. They just cut it off and the pit trail just went right into the new mud hole. And, um, and this is Penn State that's doing good things, okay? 
we as a group have not made it terribly easy for ourselves to save energy yet. There are really nice examples of what's possible, really good things being done. But it, have we gotten to the point that we can jump on our bicycle and go places without getting scrunched? Uh, and the answer is probably not, to be perfectly, I wear this color for a reason. And I walk in the winter because it's dangerous. And so part of doing the right thing and saving the energy is the personal decision, I'm going to do this. But part of doing the thing is, is building the infrastructure so it's possible. And we haven't quite gotten all the way there, I don't believe. Okay, and there's a lot of things I could co complain about on that. Um, but that leads into sort of the other issues, which is that our personal acts, our personal sweater in the winter, our t-shirt in the summer, our bicycle and what have you, get us a lot of the way there. They don't get us all the way. There was this wonderful article about two years ago that looked at U.S. investment in energy research. And since the oil embargo, when many of us were much younger, um, the U.S. government cut research on energy in half. You know, and it, you just let that sink in for a minute, faced with the knowledge, the certainty that the oil is going to run out, faced with the certainty that eventually all of this will run out, and the growing high confidence that poor people in hot places and unborn people are going to wonder what we were doing, we cut research in half. I'm sorry, this one, I, this one I don't get, I really don't. You know, bright people, you get them going on. They've turned around a little bit, but we're not sort of at the level of seriously beating this thing yet, I don't believe. I haven't seen an immense change in the majors of the students coming through classes yet. I haven't seen them stomping in and saying, I want to do energy, I want to save the world, this is what we, some of them are. There's some really amazing ones, and there's no, what the, the solar decathlon team did, and some of these, it's just truly amazing. But, um, but there's not a lot of them yet. And, and I don't think we've told the new generation that this is where their future is and that we'll make sure it works yet. And so that's something that's, that's worth, worth doing so, uh, as far as I'm concerned. Bright people always work. Now, there's a couple things to remember. If you're doing the right thing, if you're trying to solve this, there's going to be a lot of people try to tell you how stupid you are. There's no question that if you do the right thing, that does not solve the problem. And if you do the right thing, that does not solve the problem. Eventually, we're going to have to get a lot of people to do the right thing, and that's going to include China and India as well as us. And there's a lot of people out there sort of saying, oh, you know, they're not going to play along, so just don't worry about it. It's, it is necessary that we do the right thing. It's not sufficient, but it is necessary. And I truly don't believe, having talked to some people from, from other countries, having done some discussions in the international arena, there's a lot of people say, you're using a hundred times your personal energy, almost all fossil fuels, and we're using 10. We're not going to lead. We might follow, but what about you leading? because you're sort of ahead of us here a little bit, and you've been doing this for a while. And so if you do talk to people in the international arena, they say, look, you, you, you are not going to solve the problem. But the problem will not be solved without you. And I think that's very clear. The other thing you'll run into very often are people who, who do this business of saying, oh, don't waste your energy trying to solve energy. If you do that, you know, what about malaria? Shouldn't you be solving malaria? You take your money and you invest it in, in solving CO2, and what happens to malaria? What about AIDS? What's wrong with you? You're putting money in this, it should be in that. And of course, this is this false dichotomy. We never do anything else that way. We never look at our, our lives and say, wow, the roof is leaking and I need to see the doctor. I'll do one and not the other we find an optimum to do both of them. 
and that may mean that we have less to invest in, in what we want in some things, but, but always you find if you, there's a number of problems, you address them. And so there's a lot of people who will yell at you with this false dichotomy. You solving CO2 is, is dooming people. Oh, come on, this is craziness. I and mean, we know better than that, okay? So, so, so keep track of that. If we do the right thing, we're going to have to sort of enjoy it, right? You got to look up in the morning and say, wow, that was cool. Um, you have to have a community that looks at this and says, yeah, that's all right. Um, that's a cool bicycle. And, and yeah, maybe I don't have the coolest outfit, but somebody will come up with it. And, you know, once we get there, uh, if we sort of, sort of get to, to sort of, you, you got to do this with people. And you got to do this so that you're appreciating what others do. There is a huge sort of learning curve on this. If you decided today that you wanted, your shingles are going, and you want new shingles on your roof, and let's get a solar in there while we do, and you call up the person who does this, they probably don't know how to put the solar thing on your roof. Okay, and they may not know about, you know, putting the hot water at the point of use rather than the heater, and there's a bunch of things. And there's an activation energy. And the pain, and the plain pain, is that, that somewhere there's a leading edge and somewhere there's a bleeding edge. And a few of you doing the right thing are going to be on the bleeding edge. But eventually that gets to the leading edge, and eventually that gets to, oh, yeah, that's the answer. You know, and at the point where the standard contractor comes in and says, I got your solar system, let's put it on the roof. Then the world has changed a whole lot. Something is, there, there's, there's a climb to get there, and it's going to take a little getting together and agreeing and elbowing each other, and, and it's not going to be easy, and we're not all going to do all of it. Some of us will do some and some of the other, but it's the learning how. And I personally believe we have a window of a few decades to learn how. And if we learn how in a small number of decades, our grandkids and their grandkids are going to thumbs up. Everybody is happy and healthy. And if we don't learn how in a few decades, then the climate's really going to start crashing in. And we're going to be, that's a personal opinion, but I think that we have a small window here that we can learn how to do this. And there's a huge, once you learn, most of the hard work is done. Then people are going, oh, yeah, I want a piece of that, too. That's all right. You know, your shingles are making electricity and you're selling it to the little power cord. Yeah, this is all right. I can do some of that, okay? Um, on the way, I can, I can brag a little bit. You know, I'm a lot happier on my bicycle than I am stuck in a car. And yeah, on a rainy day when it's 35 degrees, it's a little tough. But, but I am a lot happier on my bicycle than I am stuck in a car. And, and I'm going to brag, and I apologize for this, but I play in a soccer league. And the soccer league ranges from, I'm 50, it ranges from a little older than me down to college. Okay, so this whole ring, it's one of these friendly leagues that we don't keep scoring, we don't keep standings, and what have you. But, but we, were out, we were out playing soccer Saturday. And I scored two goals. And the second one, I came all the way out of the defense. I passed the defense on the other side on a through ball. I outran the entire defense, and I scored. Now, I am not fast, OK? I'm a stumpy guy. And if you were to have tried to turn me into a track star, it would never happen. The only reason that I could outrun them is it was late in the game, and I ride my bicycle. And that's it, you know, and it, it really is cool, okay? And so there's a lot of benefits of, of knowing you're doing the right thing in the morning, of finding people who do it with you and talking about it and getting along with them, of the health benefits, of the saving the money benefit. $4 a gallon gas, if you're getting 16 miles to the gallon in town, you're spending 25 cents a mile to run the car just for the gas plus the repairs and all the other stuff, right? You drive across town and back to get something from the store. It's three bucks just for the gas. We are spending about now $2,000 per person per year to import oil. 2000 you sent $2,000 overseas to import oil, and you sent $2,000 overseas, and you spent this year $2,000, $2,000, $2,000, $2,000, $2,000, $2,000, okay? And it's not always the people that are going to do with the money exactly what we would do with the money. <laughs> okay? <laughs> 
Um, if you hadn't got that one. Um, it's sometimes even to people that may not entirely like us. Um, but they like the $2,000 per person per year that we're spending overseas to import. So, so I, don't, I don't have any good practical ideas, really. I think you'll get some people down the road that may be useful to you. But in terms of a pep talk, there's good to be done. We can do good, we can do well, we can get to some places. Um, we can do it individually, we can do it collectively. What you do does matter. Okay, you can't solve the problem by yourself, but what you do does matter because eventually it is a ratcheting up that gets to the solution of these things and you have to start somewhere. And so thank you for coming out today and that isn't very long, but let's have a little chat if you'd like to. I have a question. First of all, thank you. This was really great. I have a question. Yeah, we have big brains, and the evolution is speeding up considerably. If you just look back a few hundred years, it was much slower. So my question is, why do you think does it take so long for us to get out of this burning of fossil fuels habit? Well, it's so easy, and it's so cheap. Even at $4 a gallon, it's still, I mean, that's sort of milk, right? That's what we pay for milk, and that's sort of what you pay for bottled water if you go over there. So, so it's still not terribly expensive, uh, bizarre as that seems. And um, so I think it's just that it's so easy, and in the short term, we don't have a glib answer. So we know a lot of ways that you could get from where we are to where we would like to be. And there, you could pick a whole bunch of different paths that will get you there. But putting them in place is gonna be 30 years. It's, and, and, and 30 years I pick out of the thin air, but, um, but I think that's the right number. And the one I keep remembering is a completely different thing, but it's related, which is, um, I when it would be, 70, something like that, that Richard Nixon declared war on cancer, right? And I can remember, I, if we could put a man on the moon, we could cure cancer, okay? <laughs> and it, it sort of took 30 years until some cancer death rates started to drop. And it was this immense learning curve. Of course, we haven't cured it. That was way too glib. But there was this immense learning curve. And then people said, that one and that one and that one we can get. And I think that we face this same sort of thing here. Is that, yes, there's enough energy from the sun. We know the shape of what solar cells would look like. We know what windmills would look like. But actually siting and putting them in and using the energy and connecting enough of the power grid that you get by the local fluctuations when the cloud goes by or the wind speed changes, there's a lot of really good engineering goes into this. And I think it's a 30-year problem. I don't think it's a 10-year problem. In the UK, however, new housing has to have some kind of uh, carbon remission, whether it's solar cells or passive energy or something like that. And that's mandated. Why don't we do that? Uh, wrong person to answer that. I don't know. <laughs> um, I mean, this is voters, ultimately. This is, this is who's talking about what in the election. And it's, it's, I think the UK sort of got interested in this. The Europe in general became interested in these issues faster than we did. Um, they are a little lower in energy use than we are. But ultimately, this is a voter question, you know, and it's who we elect. Yeah. Sorry. Richard, to get to where you said we need to get to, what are the most, if you had a magic wand, what are the, the most highly leveraged strategies or policy or education or funding that you would like to see to get us where we need to get to? Um, I, first of all, I believe in students. You know, I, when we see what happened with the ozone hole, uh, this, is a, this is a useful example. It was a much smaller problem. But when we see what happened with the ozone hole, um, chlorofluorocarbons were a good idea. 
they seemed like it, you know, because you get to a refrigerant that does the refrigerating that we like and that it's not grossly toxic if the pipe breaks and it doesn't corrode the pipes and it, if you're in the freezer and the pipe breaks, you don't die and things like that. It was a great idea, okay? And then, uh-oh, what's going to happen to these things? And then the idea of ozone came in. Um, and then we started looking at, well, maybe we could use a roll-on rather than a spray. But we weren't getting serious about it. The ozone hole popped in, and then we, you get really worried. But we're still not really getting there until the technical fix was available. And at the point where the technical fix was available, sign an international treaty, and it will be solved. It's in the process of being solved now. Now, the technical fix for energy, some of it will be new inventions. It will be somebody coming up with the latest and greatest uh, thing. A lot of it is, is more engineering, so it's somewhere where, and it is ultimately this question, can you call the local contractor and get the best stuff put in um, at the competitive price? You know, so a lot of it is getting down to engineering. So I, a lot of this is telling the students this matters. We'll support you in learning how to do things. We'll support you as engineers as well as scientists. We'll support you as technologists. We'll get some of you who know how to put these things in. And so I think the first thing you do is you bet on students. The second one is a lot harder because the second one is ultimately to make um, to get rid of any, any price benefit for, for changing the environment and to give a price benefit for not changing the environment. And so if you dive, got some friends who are economists who look at this and they say the easiest way to solve the problem would be a revenue neutral tax on carbon. And this is not, I'm, I'm, an, I'm outside my expertise here now completely, so I am quoting other people that I've spoken to, but this is, they say, look, we go in now and we tax things, we use taxes to affect behavior. We don't want you to smoke, so we tax cigarettes. We don't want you to drink, so we tax, tax liquor. We um, want you to own a house, so we untax mortgage payments. Um, and then we tax income. Right, so we tax getting wealthy, and that this is sort of different thing. You know, it's 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 discouraging something that we would like to encourage. And so you talk to an economist who cares about the climate, and what I tend to hear from them is, if you were to cut the income tax and raise the carbon tax so that it's neutral, the government's not taking any more of your money, and if you switch to your bicycle, you're going to save, and if you don't, then you're going to pay. That if you do that, and Everybody knows that that's going to happen and that it will get higher in the future, that the problem will solve itself. If we have the bright students ready to solve the problem and we have the economic incentive to do it, that it will solve itself. And it doesn't even take a high tax. It's not that you want to make gasoline $6 a gallon tomorrow. It is that you tell everybody that in 30 years it will be. And the economists are fairly clear that if we have bright people to solve the problem and we have the knowledge that it, that it will get expensive, that that will get us there. Um, but it takes the bright people. It takes the experimentation. It takes, takes moving that direction. Yeah. Um, I think you mentioned two very strong points that people don't realize the importance of. Uh, the power of the voter, because uh, these taxes and these different um, implementations by the government to fund the different programs uh, begins at the top. But I don't believe that the government will move if the American people don't get over their complacency and start writing letters to their senators that really work. These letters, these communications, these going out and voting and, and voicing themselves is how these changes will come about because I don't believe government people will make unpopular choices. Yeah. There's certainly people in Washington talking about it. I was down and chatted with a few senators two weeks ago about these issues. So they're, they're thinking, but you're, you're certainly right. They, I think our elected representatives really do listen to us in many cases. So.
I just wanted to ask about the compact fluorescent bulbs. I was all excited to be switching them out of my house, and then I found out eventually I was going to be poisoning somebody's landfill. Do you, do you know, have an opinion about that? Or? Yeah. Uh, again, outside my expertise, my, my opinion, my hope is that we have figured out how to recycle other things and we should be able to figure this one out too. And that in the long term we get to the point that these really are a nice solution, or at least they're a nice bridge until we get to LEDs or something like that. So, so my suspicion is that this is an all good ideas. <laughs> I won't say 100%, but 99% of good ideas have unintended consequences. And once you have an unintended consequence, you have to figure it out. But history tends to indicate that we find, that, that if it's a good enough idea, we find the patch. And in this one, you know, there's people that recycle stuff with mercury in them. And so in principle, there's no reason that you can't have a little deposit on these, that you can't have a taxpayer-supported thing that collects them, that you can't eventually be putting them in a little thing in the side of your recycling bin and throw them and then get it done. So I see no reason why you can't pull the mercury back out of these things eventually. But it's at another level, another, another action which is needed. You need somebody to address this. And I think people are, are getting the idea now that there's that, we solved the problem, Oop, there's another problem. And we're right in that gap now, but this one should be solvable. I hope, yeah. I can move right around. Um, this is, has, your presentation has a lot to what this group of people can do personally, but um, in this room represent people in outreach that touch one out of every two households in Pennsylvania, through the World Campus, through Extension, through um, uh, public broadcasting. Do you have recommendations to the group relative to well, what can we do? Because we touch so many people, we have a way to we communicate some of the, uh, the great knowledge that we have at Penn State around these issues. Yeah. yeah, how do you say this one? Because you're so good at what you do already, and you're so far ahead of the curve in so many ways, and the things you produce are so good. Mostly it is to keep doing your jobs to grow them, now that you're getting more channels, more people logging in, there's open courseware things going on, and, the, you know, and it's just to keep doing it, but to do it with this in mind. Because this now is saving energy now people care about, because it's money, and, this is, you know, and some of them care about it because of the, the, the economy. And so this, I really do see this as part and parcel of the, the land grant mission, of the, 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 you know, what was county extension, what all the things we do for the Commonwealth from the university, this is part of it. They want to know how to save energy. They want to know how to make their grandkids happy. And so you're doing it, and it's just to keep doing it with, with faith and vigor. You know, it's because you're really good already. You know, this is so, so do more of it, okay? This one's, this one's easy. Yeah, that's okay. Anybody up there? No. Oh, yes. What would you say are the underlying values of American culture that make us such enormous energy users in maybe Western culture in general? Oh boy, <laughs> you can probably answer that better than I can. Um, I, I don't know. Some of it is this, this vast view of the frontier that we can go out and do more and discover more and, you know, it's, it's sort of grab what you've got and go with it. And we all sort of live in that, you know, and I Right, so I got on the plane and I flew to Antarctica to study the ice. And, and, and I hate to think what my carbon footprint was. So, um, and it was really cool and I like that. And we, so, so there is this sort of ambivalence in us that, that we like to go out and do the next thing. I personally believe that sort of that, that ability to do it will, will pull us through. And I used, the, the analogy is, you know, if, you're, if you were evil Knievel and you're trying to jump over 22 um, trucks out there with your motorcycle, if you go up at five miles an hour, you're gonna mash the first one, right? You hit the ramp at five. <laughs> okay, this is not gonna work. If you hit the ramp at 70, you'll go over. And I just have this, 
if, I'm optimistic at some level, and I think eventually this, this we will do it, we will beat it, will actually get us there. That we're, we're hitting the ramp at 70 or 80. <laughs> and I just hope the ramp is sturdy and we got it, in, we got it steering well because we could go off the edge. And, and, but, but I think we can do this. And I think it is that sort of what got us here will get us out. But it's going to be, you know, the steering gets real important if you're doing this. And whether we've really got a firm hand on it right now is a good question. <laughs>